is an invitation you must not refuse. Who likes getting invited to an awesome party? There's gonna be some great food, some great friends and family, some awesome time together, maybe some good music. Go on the beach, Kani Kapila, just play some music and sing and hang out. Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> good times. Uh, there, was a, there was a celebration last night that I got invited to and I uh, refused to go. Uh, the, the, the after party for the Mercy, the Mercy Project yesterday. And so I, 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 I was at home, I had to take care of my, my wife and kids, please be praying for them, they're sick. But I tell you, I was sitting there, I was like, man, I know they're just having a great time over there. I, I saw them steaming the lao lao in the afternoon, and I'm like, oh, why couldn't you have started this lao lao this morning? Why are you guys starting at four o'clock when I'm Pahana's already? <laughs> A uh, long, hard, hot day in the sun. Ben and I had a great time with uh, Limana's father, Robert, as we were making the deck for the uh, office for, these, uh, for the homeless shelter over there. Really good time. Uh, but it was a rough day. But at the end of that day, I sure wish I could have went to that celebration. But amen. It, it's, it's all good. I, I'll forgive you guys for not making me a plate. <laughs> I, I love how God is always giving me opportunities to show grace and mercy. You're welcome. <laughs> You know, throughout the Bible, throughout the scriptures, God is always sending us awesome invitations, right? Uh, Jesus, when he walked the earth, he invited us, he said, come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. You know, Jesus' invitations were all through, like, come, come, come and follow me, and I'll give you everything you need. I'll take care of you if you seek me first. I'll take care of you. I want to be with you. God always gives us invitations. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never go thirsty. He's inviting to give us fulfillment and satisfaction and take care of us and feed us spiritually in this life. You know, Jesus is always inviting us. The Bible is always inviting us way back in the Old Testament. God sends us these awesome invitations. And I want to go through a section of scripture in the book of Isaiah chapter 55 and we're going to pull some awesome invitations that God has for us today. We can, we can put it into practice in our life here. And, uh, you know, the incredible thing is uh, with God's invitations from the very beginning until right now today, it's always voluntary. God never forces us to accept his invitation. We can make a decision, though, to accept it or to reject it. It's entirely up to us. Point number one, an invitation to be wonderfully fed. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. The Bible here says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affairs. No, the Bible here is saying your money's no good here. That's not like what I'm offering to feed you and give you is for your soul. You don't need money to buy what I have. Why spend your money, he says, on things that are not going to last, things that are not going to satisfy you, and why and things that are not going to fulfill you. Come to me, what I have is free, and it's going to be good for you, and you're going to love it. And you'll be fired up to be wonderfully fed. You know, it's alarmingly sad how so few accept this invitation from God to be have, have satisfaction in their life. Something good, something that's not going to rot or perish or spoil or fade away. It's mind-boggling how people would prefer to basically eat trash instead. You guys ever hear of that term dumpster diving? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw my dad under the bus here a little bit. Uh, uh, please don't send him this video. It'll embarrass him. No, I'm just kidding. Send him the video for sure. <laughs> so when we were kids growing up, my dad, he was kind of nuts. He would like make these blender drinks and he, he'd just throw all kinds of st some random stuff in there. Like he, he was the dad that wouldn't throw away the ketchup bottle, but he would put water in it and so he could make them last a bit longer. Except sometimes he would put like Coca-Cola in it. Like that's my dad. Like he'd make these blender drinks and these concoctions and, and I just wouldn't take it. I'm like, I, I know how my dad is, you know. I'm like, nah, I'm good, dad. That might give me an upset stomach. Because <laughs> you, know, you just randomly go through the refrigerator, da, 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 and it's like this greenish liquid, you know. I'm like, nah, I'm good, thanks, thanks dad. And my dad had like a cast iron gut. He's, he's invincible. He's like in his 70s now, strong as an ox, no problem at all. 
And uh, he would, uh, he, but he would also too, he would go dumpster diving. He, uh, he'd come home with a whole pickup truck full of bread. And I'm like, he's like, I got all this free bit bread from the store. It's free. They're giving it away. I'm like, what do you mean they're giving it away? <laughs> well, yeah, it was in the dumpster behind, the, like, asking questions. Come, come to find out, it was from the dumpster. And I'm like looking at the expiration dates are all like long past due, right? So if you take off that little bit of green mold there, it'll be just fine. No worries, you know? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, Dad. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Guaranteed food poisoning right there. You know, I'll pass on that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's rotten. It's, no, it's, it's edible. No, it's rotten. No, it's edible. <laughs> I was like, I'll eat the ramen in the package. <laughs> no thanks on the, on the rotten food. You know, I think for us, you have to understand something. You know, God is offering us something that's good that's not going to a rot or it's not going to spoil it's not going to fade away he's offering to take care of our soul for all of eternity that's what he's offering us here and he say don't spend your money on things that are not going to last don't go in the dumpster of this world anything besides god is dumpster diving anything besides what the lord is offering us is not going to is not going to help us in the long run as a priority we have got to seek god with all of our hearts the, the king james version is a pretty interesting take on this you know, it says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. And I read that, and he said, Ho. He starts it off with Ho. And I was like, Oh, they're speaking pigeon in the Old Testament. <laughs> it's like, Ho, oh, boy, come eat. Get on the phone giants. Let's go. You, know, you guys ever heard of Ho, oh, boy, come eat. Come eat. Go over here. Right there. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, they're speaking pigeon over there. An old preacher wrote about this. Uh, uh, he says, Oh, the condescension of God, that he should, as it were, become a beggar to his own creature and stoop from, his, from the magnificence of his glory to cry to foolish and ungrateful men. See, God shouldn't have to beg us to come to him. It's something he's offered, but he, doesn't need, he shouldn't have to chase us down and beg us, please, please come and like me, please come and love me, please come and eat what I have to give your soul. God shouldn't have to beg us. Here's the thing, guys. It's not necessarily an invitation to everyone. It says here, Come all you who are thirsty, right? If we aren't thirsty for God, then we will never come to Him. We've got to be thirsty for Him. We've got to hunger for Him. We've got to desire it even more than Ben's Lao Lao. I was talking to Lehman's dad, Robert. He's like, yeah, someone gave us some Lao Lao uh, recently. And they're like big, huge Lao Lao's. And we we're super fired up. We heated them up and we, we steamed it and we're ready to eat it. We start eating and it turns out there's marshmallow inside the Lao Lao marshmallows in the lao lao and he said i just couldn't do it i couldn't eat it it looked good from the outside but when you got into it it was no good at all yeah i, I don't know don't ask me I, I i don't even know he's like i tried it i was like i had to just try it like maybe i just kind of fathom how it would taste good he said i tried it i couldn't eat it so i had to give it away to somebody else and, and, and people wouldn't even take it for free. I had to actually throw it away. <laughs> and for us, we cannot treat God's word like lao lao with marshmallows in it. <laughs> it's good for you and it's free. Don't throw it out. <laughs> but we can't just look through it and pick out the parts we like either. We gotta like God's word and God himself and his son Jesus and even his family in its entirety. Amen. Amen. The Bible here says that those who do answer God's invitation don't need to bring any money, which is cool. It won't really do you any good, he says here. You can simply bring this currency, right? Your faith, your trust, your love, and your obedience to him. That's the currency that buys from us what God is giving. These things are free. He says he'll provide for us the richest affairs. La la with no marshmallows. <laughs> Bread with no mold. <laughs> <laughs> and blender drinks that you know what's in there like <laughs> strawberries bananas and milk or something like that <laughs> see for us yes we do fundraising yes we do uh, have the collection in the back we do a contribution message we do our special missions drives twice a year but that's not what Christianity is all about it's not about how much money you can give how much money you can raise although it is important but that's not what it's about right money that us spending that kind of money on our contribution or or sending out fifty two thousand dollars to help out missionaries from this small church uh, those are amazing things and there, there's things to you know be proud of ourselves for for coming to and doing but here's the thing that's not what's going to buy our way into heaven 
Uh, the currency that God's looking for is love and hope and faith and trust and treating each other right and doing what's right. That's the currency that gets us into heaven. And it's not by our works, but it's by our love of God and obedience to Him. But here's the thing about money, too. I mean, it's, money is an integral and important part of Christianity and of life. You know, and the, and the reality is we spend our money on what we care about. If we care about saving souls, that's what we'll spend our money on too, amen? And that's why we do have a collection so that we can save souls. And I, and I wanna say I'm super proud of this church once again that we hit our special missions goal. It was amazing. There was a lot, a lot of hard work and sacrifice, but yeah, definitely, good times, right? But here's the thing, a little bit of a reality check. I got together with Robbie, we went over the finances and the budget in the church, and we're still pretty, we're like, the, the financial situation in the church is not that great right now for our local expenses, right? So we do have to keep the lights on, et cetera. And uh, yeah, it's not that great right now. So what we really need to do is take seriously what we're spending our money on uh, so that we can fulfill our financial obligations of, as those of us as members of the church have agreed to help out a certain amount every week with our tithing and, and our offering and stuff like that. So I wanna, just, I wanna really challenge the church to take those things seriously. Um, if you've been under giving and you need to adjust your amount, talk to Robbie, who's the administrator. Um, if you've been skipping and missing your contribution from time to time, please make up what you miss because the church financial situation is not, is not in the greatest of spots. But I'm faithful. I believe in you guys, and I'm, and I'm not worried or concerned about it. But I just wanted to throw that out there because I love you guys. Amen. Challenge for us is to take that invitation that God is giving to pick up your Bible, read it, and put it into practice. Point number two, an invitation to be faithfully loved and led. Continuing our reading here in verse 3, God's offering us an awesome promise here in verse 3. <clears throat> Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that you do not know you will, ha will hasten to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with his splendor. This is amazing here. But God says, I have a promise I want to make you guys. Something I want to give you guys. Uh, uh, the same love and the same faithfulness that I gave to my servant, King David. But what did God, what was that promise that God made to King David? He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He gives, he gives David trust, his love. And he says, with you, I'll make this covenant, this promise, that in the future, even Jesus will come from your lineage. What an incredible promise. And God says, he wants to offer that same promise to us today, his love and faithfulness to us, right? And um, <clears throat> this is pretty interesting. You know, God's like, listen, come to me. Like, Take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth for a moment there and just listen to what I have to say. I have something that's gonna benefit you massively. This is going to really help you out. So just listen up at this moment. This is super important. He makes this promise of, of mercy and love to us, right? In verse 3, it's pretty interesting. In part, three, uh, part 2 of verse 3, it says, I will make an ever, everlasting covenant with you. So this is a future promise that Isaiah prophesied about. This is like an everlasting and overlapping promise that God has for his people. See, God blessed Israel with King David, with an awesome and powerful leader. says a leader and a commander. And, and that was God's blessing to his people. For us today, we are the spiritual Israel, and this everlasting promise is given us today and that we are promised uh, um, awesome leadership within the church even. See, the, the sad thing about it, though, is not everyone sees it that way. Not everyone sees that the term leadership is kind of a, can be a scary term, right? Uh, we in America, especially here in Hawaii, we don't like thinking that someone's leading us or over us. We, we don't like that term. America was built and formed on, on rebellion against leadership, and we kind of have that in our DNA, uh, especially here in Hawaii, too. Like, America came in and basically conquered and took over Hawaii. We don't like thinking of anybody over us here in Hawaii. It's like, that's an unpleasant topic, right? And I'm not going to get into the politics of any of that kind of stuff, but here's the thing. We, don't, we just don't like that. We don't like that term. It's, it's just not, it's, it's unpleasant. 
uh, the Jewish nation, they went through that as well uh, throughout the ages. It's, just not, it's not unique to any of us. We just don't like the term leadership. We don't like having a boss at work. Uh, if you're a teenager, you don't like having a mom and dad tell you what to do at home. Uh, if, you're, if you're in school, you don't like your teachers telling you what to do. And you can start to feel like controlled and people being bossy and stuff like that. It's just unpleasant. Uh, a couple of years back, well actually more than a couple of years, about 15 years ago when I was a young man. <laughs> before, uh, before I was a Christian though, I, I, as many of you know my past, I was an alcoholic. And so I had this neighbor uh, back in Waimanalo where I live. And a really good friend of mine, great guy, and him, him and I, we were drinking buddies. He was an older guy and we would just, we would just get drunk together pretty often. And his wife really didn't like me, actually, because every time he came over, he'd come home stumbling drunk. That's what we did. We were drunkards, you know. It was, it was pretty sad. But he, we were good friends. Uh, I started studying the Bible. I quit drinking, and I became a Christian and gave my life to God, and I, I became a changed person. And I completely repented. It was amazing, you know. And God healed me from the drunkenness and, and all that. It was, it was awesome. And so the first thing I started doing was I would tell all my friends that I used to drink with. And one of my, one of my good friends, Jerry, my neighbor, that... Check it out, man. I quit drinking. I got baptized. I became a Christian, man. You should come check out my church. And he, he was standing there in my yard. I remember at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He's got his beer in his hand. He's like, yeah, I'm really glad for you that you quit drinking. You should really need to stop drinking. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, yeah, you're right. It's true. That's, that's a true statement. Uh, but you should come too. And so he started coming to our Bible talk, and he, he met some of the disciples there. And check this out, guys. This is my neighbor for years. And turns out that he used to go to the same church that we used, that we go to. Back in the day, him and his whole family were disciples. They were all Christians. Uh, sadly, they walked away, but here we are. The kingdom of God moved right in next to the north of them, in a sense. And, and he started studying the Bible, and he was super fired up. He's very encouraged. He's like, wow, I need to start coming back to church. This is great, man. I missed that fellowship and the singing, and, and the preaching was amazing. So I can't wait to tell my wife about this. I was like, hey, amen, let's see how that goes. Comes back the next day, he's like, yeah. Talked to my wife, and he has his adult children live with him as well. And his daughter was there, and, and why would you want to go back to that church? They're so controlling. And that one negative statement, he's like, yeah, you know what? You're right. They're very controlling over there. And so he's like, yeah, I'm good. I'm not going to come to church or you guys Bible talk. I'm fine. And he just kept on with his life of drinking, partying and drinking. And we just went our separate ways. He, sadly, he, him and his family moved to the mainland, and then about two years after that, I saw on the news that his daughter that was in the kitchen that day that said that to him, she uh, unfortunately and very sadly was in a relationship with someone and uh, her boyfriend and he ended up murdering her. And then he came back to the scene of the murder and charged with the police and they shot him. And I just remember seeing that and just watching their family fall apart and spiral down where I was just watching it on Facebook like a tra train wreck that I couldn't stop. And I just remember, man, God was offering them to be led by people through God, but they found a fault. They found some kind of problem with what was happening. And let's be honest, I don't know, maybe they were controlling. I don't know. I don't know the people they were talking about, the people that they're with. And uh, the reality though is leaders aren't perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're all imperfect. We all make mistakes, but that's never ever an excuse to walk away from God. You know, let's, let's talk about King David. The Bible here is using King David as a great example of leadership. The Bible says this is a great pattern of leadership, but let's look at King David's life. Yeah. Murder, adultery, incest and rape among his children, murder among his children. One of his children tried to overthrow the, the throne. Civil war in the country he was presiding over. That's who King David was. And the Bible says King David is an awesome and great leader and commander of the people. You know, that teaches us something very important here. The reality that leaders are not perfect. You know, and David using, or God using King David as an example of great leadership. You know, one commentator wrote about it. He says, David is here lifted up as a wonderful leader of God's people. This shows that David's heart after God meant more than outward success. Comfort and ease. It also shows that God's best and most effective don't necessarily have it easy. Even though David deserved to die. For the adultery and the murder, God chose to love him and to have mercy on him and to use him as a pattern and an example of great leadership. Why? Because he was a man, an imperfect man, after God's own heart, the Bible says. So it's so important for us, no matter what station of life we're at, what, 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 what level of leadership we may, may or may not be in, is to be a man 
or a woman after God's own heart. And to have mercy and be strong in the grace with the imperfections of each other, whether we're in leadership or not. God is inviting us to be loved and to be led. I love to be able to call up the people that lead our churches. Uh, Mike Underhill over on Oahu, he disciples us in our church here, and I can call him up anytime. And he answers the phone, and we get, I get to talk about, uh, I get to ask for advice. I get to get open about my struggles and my sins and the mistakes that I make in my life and my ministry and my marriage. And sometimes I get a stern rebuking. Sometimes I get a l- advice I don't agree with. But amen, that's awesome. I get to call up Kyle, who used to lead this church, and he gives me great and wonderful wisdom and advice. But I don't always agree with it. But I always listen to it. Amen. I get to call up Tim, Tim who leads our world sector. I get to call up Kip. Kim McKean, he leads our whole family of churches around the world. He oversees all the, all the whole church, over 10,000 disciples. And he always calls me back within 24 hours. I've never once over the years, no matter what station I was, whether I was in leadership or just a member of the church, I could call him up and he always calls me back and listens to what I have to say. What an incredible, incredible uh, experience we get to have with so much awesome leaders in our heart, in our, in our fellowship. And I think too is that to understand too is that the the, the, the Bible here, this prophecy in Isaiah says that the, the, the nations will hearken to you that do not know you, right? The, the, the people of Israel at that time were so blessed through God's leadership that people came from all over the world to see what was going on in Israel because God was blessing them. And it's the same for us today and that we get to go all these different nations, plant all these different churches all over the world. So are any of us could go to any of the different countries in the, that our churches are in, over 50 countries and over 130 congregations right now that we could go to and have the same type of awesome experience that we have here in Hilo. Amen. So, for us, let's always take the cotton, be willing to take the cotton out of our ears and put it in our mouth and, and, and get good biblical advice and take good biblical, biblical advice from each other. Amen? Point number three. An invitation to be totally forgiven. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 55 in verse 6. The Bible here says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will freely pardon Wow, this is amazing. It's probably you're saying that while God can be found, if we're going to seek him and we're going to turn to him, we can forsake our evil thoughts and our evil ways and we can be pardoned. We can be forgiven no matter what you did in this past week or yesterday or the past couple of years or your whole life or whatever. And when we turn to God, there's an opportunity to be forgiven, totally forgiven. A once in a lifetime chance to find God, to find forgiveness and to find Mercy. It's that get out of jail free card. You know, we were, um, <clears throat> we all mess up, right? We talked about that a little bit. We all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. And uh, I was uh, fortunate to go and hang out with Ben and uh, Robert and build uh, some, do some carpentry work. Now, I'm not a carpenter. I think it's going to be obvious. <laughs> uh, but I have done some carpentry. I know a little bit about con- carpentry. Ben, on the other hand, he's an awesome carpenter. Robert, on the other hand, great carpenter. Uh, but they're not perfect carpenters and uh, as we were making some cuts in the wood and and drilling some things in and lining things up and measuring and remeasuring there were some mistakes that got made and we're just like turn that board over we'll just bury that underneath the deck (laughs) that's a little bit off we'll just put a shim in there or something oh it's okay just bang those nails in nobody will ever know just put a lot of paint you know what I mean? And we start to cover up our mistakes. You know, it's, it's nine hours in the very, very hot sun. I got like, I turned into a different race out there. I think I was in the sun so long. I was like, man, I'm getting smoked out here. And, was, and so, you know, the heat starts to affect your brain. You know, you get tired. The water's just not enough. And, and, and Ben's scrambling because Lehman is calling him. Are you done yet? The next crew's coming in. He's like, he's like hurrying, like, oh, let me think, let me think. He's walking around. And, and as we rush, we make more mistakes. And that, those stairs are awesome on the outside. But if you crawl underneath that deck like Ben did, like underneath and take a look, like what happened in here? But they'll be fine, right? You can walk on those stairs. I'll take the other way though. <laughs> but that's how we can be as Christians sometimes, right? When we, when we make our mistakes, they can start to pile up and we try to conceal them. They hide, we hide them below the surface. We keep them secret. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want anybody to find out and we try to hide it. 
and we try to conceal it. But if you were to examine closely, there'd be some issues, there'd be some problems. And none of us are perfect, so that's the case. Now, it's not that we as disciples, we start like, looking around for chinks in people's armors or the mistakes they make. I can tell you right now, I ain't got time to be a private investigator and tailgate Eli to make sure he's behaving himself, quote unquote, you know what I mean? Oh, you didn't show your face with that guy. I saw you walk by him. That's not, that's not, I ain't got time for that. I certainly don't want anybody doing that with me either, like a, a cop with a ticket book. That's not what we are as brothers and sisters in this church at all. But we, have, we do make mistakes, and when we do, we got to turn to God. What does it mean to turn to God? It means to don't deny it, just admit it. You know what I mean? You can, you, can, you, can, you can lie to me about your sin or conceal it from me, whatever. You can lie to yourself. That's a little bit weird. But don't lie to God. He already knows. He already knows and he wants to help you to be perfect, to be holy, to be pure, to be solid like that deck we built. Even though there's some, some, some you know, a little bit gaps here and there that maybe, you know, if, if we had two more days, it would have been less gaps. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> it's as simple as that turn to God and receive his, his, his receive this promise of forgiveness see repentance amongst God's people is the key to benefiting from this invitation from God Paul knew this when he wrote it in 2 Corinthians he said that we must take captive of our thoughts and make them obedient to Christ he said it in Romans chapter 12 one of Curtis's favorite chapters the verse right before he says we must not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. See, the passage here says that the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. It starts in our thoughts and it comes out in our way, in our deeds. And if we transform and renew our mind by turning to God in confession and repentance, and some wonderful things can be done in our lives by God. Amen? It's what's being offered by Him. The issue is never that God will reject us when we turn on The issue is we fail to turn to Him. See, Satan is a very crafty creature. He's always going to try and trick us. He's going to trick us in the beginning when, through our thoughts. He's going to get in there and he's going to try and convince, them, convince us that if we sin, there will be no consequences. And then when we do mess up, then when we do sin, he tries to convince us that there's no forgiveness and we get stuck in a trap. It's a lie. We keep, we're, we're meant to renew our thoughts and renew our minds and make every effort to not sin. But God knows that we do and so he has a plan to forgive us so no matter how bad it has been or no matter how much it is or what it is. There's no, no problem too big or too small for God. He wants to forgive us all for everything. But we've got to turn to him and that's the only way we'll get pardoned. In closing, this is what Christianity is all about right here. This is what is being offered by God. The question is, is this what you want? I don't know where each and every one of you are at this morning. Where you want it badly, you're not sure if you want it at all, or you definitely don't want it. It could be anywhere, right? I don't know. But let's read this encouraging passage here, closing out our scripture in verse 8. And I think this is something, this is one of my favorite uh, verses, uh, sections of scripture in the Bible. The Bible here says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. See, God sends out his word in the same way that he sends out the rain and the snow to take care of this beautiful planet that we live on. And he wants to take care of our, each and every one of us. You're all beautiful and precious to him, even more than the plants and the birds of the air. We're much more precious to him. So he sends out his word. And, it's, and it doesn't return to him empty. It accomplishes what it desires. But whether it accomplishes good in you or whether it's a wasted on you is entirely up to you. The invitation is for each and every one of us each day to make that decision to let God's word impact us in powerful ways. How far is this distance between God's thoughts and ours? How far is the distance between his ways and our ways? The distance is as great as the heavens are higher than the earth. It's way different. It's a far distance but it still will accomplish what he desires. So here's the thing. When God is sending out his word, 
to us like he is right now, he knows exactly what he's doing. And we are left with a choice to make this morning. That's up to us to accept that invitation or to reject that invitation. Will we accept the invitation of his faithful love and the blessings of wonderful leadership? Will we accept the invitation to be wonderfully fed and never left unsatisfied? Will we accept his invitation of mercy and total forgiveness for whatever mess we've gotten ourselves into lately? That's our choice. Now here's the thing, family. I truly believe 100% that God's word will impact and change every single one of us and it will go out of this, uh, from this uh, park and do better and be better for God. I truly believe that this invitation will not go in one ear, out the other ear, and return to God. But I love you guys so much. Aloha.